welcome to the, what is this, the 16th installment of the Mystery at the Library Book Club, which is really awesome. 16, woo, over a year now. Um, so I am Rebecca Vanuk. Hello, my friends. Uh, I'm the executive director of Library Reads. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time tonight, Library Reads is a list. We it's a it's an organization that puts out a list every month, the top 10 books that library staff across the US are recommending to their patrons as some of their favorite books. Um, I won't belabor the point. You can go to our website, which is librarireads.org, and you can see the latest list. You can find out all about us. And tonight we have one of our Library Reads authors with us, Susanna Kearsley. So this, as I mentioned, is the 16th installment of this Mystery at the Library series, which is brought to you by our friends at Sourcebooks and Baker and Taylor. We're streaming tonight on Zoom and on Facebook Live, so welcome to our Facebook friends. As I mentioned, I am thrilled to be here with international best-selling author Susanna Kearsley to talk about her newest book, The Vanished Days. Now, before we begin, I have my usual housekeeping things to share. If you have questions for Susanna tonight, and we hope you do, um, you can utilize the Google form, which will be linked in the chat box. Um, please use that chat box all evening. Say hello to each other. Tell us where you're from. Talk amongst yourselves. That's great. But for the actual questions for the Q&A part, if you can use that Google form separately, it just helps us make sure we're not missing anything in the running commentary on the side. So use that form to send us your questions. If you have been here before, you know that's the second half of our program. We, we love getting our questions from our library friends. Always so much fun. And and don't forget, if you submit a question or if you participate in our trivia poll that happens halfway through, you will be entered to win a mystery book bundle courtesy of Sourcebooks. And we will announce the winners at the end of the program. So that is all my housekeeping stuff. Let's get into it with my new friend, Susanna. New York Times, USA Today, and Globe and Mail best-selling author Susanna Kearsley is a former museum curator who loves restoring the lost voices of real people to page, often in twin-stranded stories that interweave present and past. Her award-winning novels have been published in translation in more than 25 countries. She lives near Toronto. Hello, Susanna. I am so hey, happy Rebecca. that you could join us this evening. I am thrilled to be able to join you. Yay! Thrilled. And I know and I... You, you are a fan of libraries. We have a oh. lot of your fans with us tonight, so I know- I have to have... give a little shout out. Um, I, don't, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, but I just want to give a little shout out in case she is to my very good friend, Julie Rayner from High Point Public Library. I hope she's here, but just in case she didn't get to make it tonight, uh, she'll probably watch this later. Uh, I am like the worst friend ever. I've been promising to phone her for like a couple of months. So Julie, um, I promise I actually will phone you, but um, she's just a very good friend of mine. So, so see, yeah. who needs the phone when you can just talk to her on yeah. a video screen? Yeah. I mean, just wanted to let her know. I haven't forgotten. So. <laughs> it's the modern age. Which is really <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So let's, we're, let's jump right into it to talk about, about you and your books. So our, visitors tonight probably know you best for your richly detailed historical novels right like we don't think of you as oh a mystery author it's you, right you write right. historicals like yeah. the winter sea the firebird however your latest book the vanished days does include a good mystery element as well so tell us a little bit about that and i would like to know did you approach writing the vanished days differently than your other books because because of that mystery element or was it just sort of a natural progression tell me not really that. not really um my books are all well they're my books are kind of a marketer's nightmare because they <laughs> they don't fit neatly into anyone and mm -hmm. any like people that have read me for a while will know this it's kind of like where do you shelve me anyway <laughs> like you know it, it's um they're kind of like um the cockapoo of fiction and a, a cockapoo crossed with a labradoodle of fiction they've got history mystery romance a little bit of paranormal sometimes a little bit of everything mushed into one because I like a lot of different stuff um but my inspiration the people I read 
you know, when I was younger, um, would be like Daphne du Maurier, Mary Stewart, people that, that mushed a lot of stuff all together. Yeah. Um, so the mystery was always an element of the stories to begin with. It was just that in my books, it's always a matter of which, um, like how much of each goes into the soup, right? Some, some books uh, have more mystery in them than other ones. Mm -hmm. And in some books, the historical element takes you know, precedence in some books. There, there really isn't a historical element at all. It's more mystery. Like the shadowy horses is all contemporary, but it references the past. And um, you know, in some books, there is no dual timeline. But people think there's a dual timeline because you're you're talking about the past so much. It feels like there's a dual timeline. So it's just it's just a matter of how much mystery in each book. But it's the one common thing is it's usually people in the modern day dealing with the mystery that comes out of the past. So the different thing about this book that you know we'll probably get into later is that 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 was a little bit different about this book is that there are two stories but they're both in the past. Um, I never know till I get into the story how okay. what that mix is going to be. I mm -hmm. know that those elements are probably all going to be there, but sometimes sometimes the paranormal isn't. It, that's the one element that sometimes comes in and sometimes doesn't. Um, it's usually, if it's going to come in, it's usually the link between the present and the past. Okay. Um, but sometimes the present and the past are linked by something that is not paranormal. Sometimes it's a diary. Sometimes it's, you know, something else. Um, but if it's going to be there at all, it's usually the link. So that's the one element that is sometimes there and sometimes not. But usually the mystery is there to some degree. Mm -hmm. um because I like a good mystery I like a it's just not as my husband said it's not usually a body in the library mystery it's usually right. <laughs> something else you know it's just he always used to describe and I, people have heard me say this a million times but he always used to describe my books as like old Hitchcock movies um because there's you know there's a little bit of woo-woo going on but it's not you know it's not really super horror um, yes. ghost type thing um there's a mystery but it's not the body in the library mystery there's a yeah. romance but it's not you know it's one foot on the floor there's there's um you know there's a little bit of everything all mushed together and it's it that's the best that he could come up with with it and it's not a bad not a bad analogy it's kind of like you know if you think the birds or vertigo or something it's got it's got a little bit of everything all in yes. one well okay. i think that that's what makes your book so appealing is they're not you know, it's not like you um, you set out to be like, okay, mystery means somebody's got to die or there needs to be a crime and then we need to solve it wrapped up yet. You, you build in all those other elements, which gives it such wide appeal, right? Like you're <laughs> so not, that makes so it that sound like I actually planned it that way, but thank right. you. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wonderful if I actually did. It's just the story. The story, yes. just, that's the, just what I, I, the characters just, you know, do their thing and then mm -hmm. I and I can see how they're this one actually did you know have a lot more going on mystery wise and and you know sometimes the twists and the turns that it took I didn't know where they were going either so I just I've just learned to kind of sit back and go okay you know I, I trust you I trust that you're not going to let me down that you know by the time I get to the end of the book there will be a book um and you guys will all be mostly still standing and I do know that my my two main characters will always still be standing um because the romance part of it is always a big thing for me mm -hmm. um and I do I will never break faith with my readers that way I will always you will always have a happy ending that's um, okay that's a good always, constant to you know, know. Yes. so you know I'm a I'm a last page reader you can't read the last page of this novel that's the one thing this is the one novel you can't do that with <laughs> Be forewarned. But, but I am a last reading. page reader because I mm -hmm. don't trust other people to leave me those two people on the, on the last page. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to do that to other readers. I want to, I want them to always know that when they pick up a Susanna Kearsley book, no matter what I put the characters through, they're going to come out at the end with the characters together. Yes. You know, and that really is um, library folks. We kind of talk about that a lot when we talk about where do we classify things and what <laughs> do you consider a mystery or what do you consider a romance? And that really is like the the bottom line, no failing. That is a romance is that there yeah. has to be the happily ever after. And maybe it's not 
permanently happy and maybe it's not but but at the end of that book it needs to they need to like you said they need to be standing right. <laughs> they need to still be you there you cannot so, break that rule you right, cannot break that right, rule. it's right. not that I mean, becomes there, a different there are book. love stories <laughs> yes that's a, right know. yes but there's only one you know romance is romance and never yes. never can you break that rule exactly it's, yeah exactly exactly well this is this is really interesting i know that this this is what people kind of enjoy the most about these author discussions is sort of finding out, you know, how does that story come to you? And I love it, you know, when you said, oh, where are these characters taking me? Like oh, that no to me is just so, yeah. as a reader, I love hearing the, the people who write the stuff I love saying stuff like that, like, well, I just started and I waited to see where it was going to go. Like that's, that's such a, I don't know, it's such a fun thing about it's an intimate detail about writing so. oh, and everybody's different like every writer I've yes. got so many writing friends and we all do it differently and that's the fun thing is we'll sit down and yes you know everybody's everybody's process is different yes we one of our authors we had earlier this year uh shared his screen with us to show how he creates this enormous document of like every detail he wants to make sure gets in and all of the names to make yep. sure that he, and I was just like fascinated. And then I talked to authors who are like, you know what? I get this idea and I just let it kind of go and we see what happens. And then I have authors who are like, well, first the character appears to me and I let them take the story. And it's just, we, it's so fascinating. It's all to different. Hear. I love it. I love it's, it. And so. some people's storyboard and it's yes. whatever works. You find whatever works for you mm -hmm. and and sometimes what works for you for one book isn't going to work for the next book. Right? Bingo. That's yeah. the only way to me in which books are like children. Um, because, you know, I've got both and trust me, they're <laughs> nothing. Um, but the, the only way they're like children is that you, you think you got it all figured out with one and then you have the next one. And it's, right. yeah, it's like nothing like um, the first one. And, right. you know, so my my process, like with the historical books, what I do do is I, I do timeline um, okay. as I'm doing the research. Mm -hmm. I don't outline, but my research pages will have this very, very, um, you know, oh gosh, pages and pages and pages. Every time I'm reading um, like a letter by somebody, like a letter by, um, you know, one of the characters, the real life characters that I'm putting into the novel. Mm -hmm. And he's, let's say it's Robert Murray. Um, and he's in prison and he's writing to somebody uh, on the 23rd of September and he happens to mention that it's raining outside or something then I will go to my timeline and I was like you know September 23rd 1707 it was raining in Edinburgh and you know I'll put that in um, and I'll also put in like Robin was in prison and, and this type of thing so I, I'll just sort of so I don't lose track of that fact mm -hmm. and that goes into my timeline and so by the end of my research my timeline is very very dense and it, it will almost be like a little calendar. Of, I used to do it in daytimers, like, you know, oh, smart. Daytimers, like, you know, like old things, you know, like the, and um, I never organized my own life, but I would save them even for my characters, right? It's the, easier to do it when it's not so yours, much easier. Right? <laughs> yeah. And the, um, so I know what's happening. I, I know what the weather was like. I know who was where. I know that type of thing. My characters may not care. Mm -hmm. My characters might never use that detail. They might never do a scene on September 23rd, 1707. Mm -hmm. But if they choose to do anything on September 23rd, 1707, I can go to my timeline and say, oh, it was raining, Robin was in prison. Um, you know, this was happening over here, this was happening over there, I know where these people were. And I've got those details to at least bring into the scene. So very smart. that's my timeline, but it may or may not, you know, it's not like sitting down and doing an outline because the minute I, the minute I try to outline, I kill the story. No matter how, and I've tried to do it before when I'm panicky, when I'm approaching deadline, I try to outline what's left and it just kills the story. Dead. It just doesn't, so, it, yeah, that's it kind of work. stops the creativity. Huh? It, it puts a box like around what my characters can that do. Is. And mm -hmm. then my characters just aren't interested anymore. Yeah. yeah. And they go sit in a pub and that's it, you know. And that, <laughs> in the rain. And, <laughs> yeah, literally. And, and, you know, so I've learned to just sit back and let them go and trust the process and panic. Very interesting. Yeah. So that's, let's, let's keep talking a little bit about the research part, because I know that's, that's what our audience is very interested in, and especially mm -hmm. when it comes to historical, right? Um, you know, historical novels, always very research heavy, and your books include 
people who actually existed. So there's an Some additional them, yeah. element yeah. there that yeah. you have to make sure you're keeping straight. So we would really love to hear, you know, you told us a little bit, some hints, but tell us a little bit more about research process. And especially when you're dealing with real people and is in this book particular, like tell us, walk us through a little bit of some of the research you did for the Vanish. Of what day. I do for these, yeah. for these people. Well, these people are, you know, this is a, the Vanished Days is a sort of prequel, sort of companion book to my novel, The Winter Sea. Um, so it contains some characters that we've already met mm -hmm. in The Winter Sea. You don't have to have read The Winter Sea or The Firebird. You don't have to know anything going in. Because I don't, again, I don't like doing that to readers. Yeah. It's not like, oh, before you read this one, you have to sit down and read this one and this one. Because again, you know, I'm, I'm writing with the idea that my books may be completely off the shelf. 10 years and you might not be able to find anything other than this book in your hand that you just bought at a garage sale and you know you have to go with what you have it has to stand on its own completely mm -hmm. you know as a circle as a story by itself otherwise you're you know you're not doing your reader any favors so some of the characters we've already met but I've already researched them so I like they have I've already met them myself in mm -hmm. the pages of other research that I did um it started with one character that I found in, oh, I have, actually, here, look, I have the book right here. This little book called Ooh, Playing the Scottish always, Card. This is always yeah. a treat. This is yeah, always see? a treat. This is called Playing the Scottish Card. And this book I found back when I was, oh my gosh, maybe like 22 or something. At the, there used to be a bookstore in Toronto called the World's Biggest Bookshop. And it probably actually was. It was a massive, massive store. And this is like, it's a thin book. It's not, this is not a big book. Um, and it, uh, it um, was just sitting all by itself on this little section of a, a history section. And it was about the Franco-Jacobite invasion of 1708. And I thought, I've never heard of the Franco-Jacobite invasion of 1708. That's kind of interesting. Let's throw it in the cart and find out. So I took it home and read it and found it was really just a fascinating, episode of history where the Jacobites almost put um, Bonnie Prince Charlie's dad back on the throne. Almost, almost succeeded. They had him in the Firth of Forth on a ship and it almost worked. Um, and we never hear about it because it almost worked because the historians, the mostly English historians kind of wrote that bit out of the history books. I mean, nobody needs to hear about that. Um, so in that book mentioned maybe twice, is a man called John Murray. And because he was only mentioned kind of twice, I got interested about him because I thought, you know, who is this guy that is always sort of on the side of the action? Um, and the more I learned about him, the more I realized he wasn't in, you know, at, at the time he wasn't on the side of the action at all. He was sent by King James's mother to be in the thick of the action. And he, he was sent for a purpose and he had a much larger role to play. So. I, he went from being a side character in the story that was building in my head to being the hero of the story that was building in my head. And I got very, very personally attached to him. And, and uh, long story short, all these years later now, I mean, I'm 55 now and I, I, I am, you know, I, I go and stay with direct descendants of his brother's family. You know, like I, I, I now am, you know, just totally enmeshed in this family. I love this family so much. I love all the people of this family. And I really feel compelled to put their lives back on the page in a way that matters because the whole family was, played such a pivotal role in the Jacobite um, movement of the time. And they have just all been left off the page. And it, to me, that's a huge injustice. And I don't like injustice. That's one, you know, one key thing about me is I do not like injustice in any form or shape. And I've read their letters. I've read all these, you know, things I've seen their portraits these are all real people to me now I've walked the ground that they walked and I've met their descendants and now I you know I'm gonna spend probably the next 50 years of my life writing their stories down um so this is just a continuation really of that I, I you know I we meet John and his brothers when they were children in this book um John is not the main character of this these are the 
in the vanished days we're dealing with other people but john's brother robin who's another character that i came to just absolutely love robin was supposed to have a cameo in this book he was supposed to just you know be maybe like a half a scene character because really? he was he was conveniently actually in prison in edinburgh at the time that my characters were were dealing with this story um and uh the uh um he, being a, a murray he came into the scene and started talking and just like stole a show and ended up coming back for i think about three more scenes um and i just fell totally in love with him as readers will be able to tell when they're reading it he's just but again i've seen his portrait and he's he's a very compelling person and i've read his letters so i i go to the national records of scotland um building the the archive over there and uh, again, librarians, archivists, um, my my window to the past. Um, and there's, a, you know, just a, a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine over there who is the uh, head of the um, historical search room, um, who helps me find all these documents and who helps me navigate all the things, the records that they hold over there. And um, so, Alison Lindsay, not so she's watching, but she deserves a shout out as well. Um, and so I, Alison will help me find these these documents and I will spend, um, oh, somebody's look, asking for the, in the chat. It is yes. called Playing the Scottish Card. And it's by a man named John S. Gibson. It's published by Edinburgh University Press. I love that all of this, yeah, started just from you finding that book oh so much, so much at a store. Well, like because that, it's a, it starts with a huh, i didn't know that thing, you know just amazing then, yeah. <laughs> so i will start with i'll start with going into the archive i'll start with like looking for the documents on in this case what i started doing which is what i normally do when i find something like this is i go to the person's bibliography right okay so i go to his bibliography for example which is, you know, like I go through all that and I, and I look for his original, like what, what records did he look at mm -hmm. to write his book? Who was he looking at? And then I, then I go to the search rooms and I look up those records and read them for myself because I don't want someone else's filtered account. I want to go mm -hmm. read it myself. And mm -hmm. that introduced me not only to John Murray, and his family, but also the people in the periphery to Colonel Patrick Graham, to um, Captain Thomas Gordon, to, you know, all these other people that became real characters in my stories. Um, and then once I'm reading their letters, um, what I do is I, in the search rooms, all the stuff that I'm reading in the search rooms, other people can photo photograph their things because different collections that are, you know, given Sometimes you can photograph them, sometimes you can photocopy them, that type of thing. The ones that I am using most of the time are not photographable. I thought it was not that word, but you know, we pretend know. it is, pretend right. it's a word. Um, so what I end up having to do is like handwrite them all. Oh, you know? wow. So, okay. But there's a, there's something that's not, not terrible about that because as you're copying out the words that somebody wrote, you're actually making this little bond with them because you're mm -hmm. writing Robin's letters over again. And um, so, you know, I ended up with like a book like this full of transcribed letters and notes and papers and things. This this one is just for the vanished days, okay. um, but I have other ones for- I was just gonna say, do you yeah. save all of them for, oh, yeah. for all of your- yeah, Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I will go back to them again. Like I will okay. be, you know, like the, I have Thomas Gordon's entire letter book. Um, wow from the that I copied out love his handwriting not <laughs> um but the um the uh I used and went back to some of that um from the time that he was in Russia and it gave me certain things that I needed even for this book like little insights into his character and you get you get their way of speaking and their way of using words and their way of um their their phrasing of things and they have everybody has their pet phrases mm -hmm. and those come through even in the letters uh, it's it's quite interesting how they you know um how things will will happen and then when i'm 
lends some interesting authenticity to your your, well, your you're, dialogue. Well, you're giving their yeah. voices. Um, yeah. And sometimes, like sometimes in the letters, like there's a scene in The Vanished Days where Robin Murray is talking to my hero, Adam. Um, uh, Adam goes to deliver a, a certain letter to him. Um, and Robin gets very indignant and, and gives him this speech back about you know, why he won't turn on his friends. And I was able to use Robin's own words um, in that speech. So I, I could give him his words back, um, which is a very gratifying thing to be able to do um, after all this time. Yeah, uh, there's something I, you know, special you about that. You have to cast them into dia dialogue and not, you know, not the way he wrote it, but you can give him his own, like that's what he said in his, in his letter. And then what I carry around with me while I'm doing all this is my little, I have a myriad of these little things, you know, these little notebooks. So mm -hmm. I will take little notes of, these are my notes of what, you know, what the weather's like outside, what's going on, if I'm, that's the, you know, little drawings of things. That's, that's the room in um, Gladstone's Land, which is a real building on um, the Royal Mile on the, the I was going to say the land market, but it's not called the land market anymore. Um, the lawn market is what they call it now um, in Edinburgh, where, uh, that I used for, for my fictional Caldo's Land. And the Gladstone's land is a museum. So you can actually go in, you can walk around, okay. you can see the, the front room that I used for my, my characters. And you, they, have, uh, they have holiday flats that you can rent there oh. um, because it's run by the National Trust and a lot of National Trust buildings, you can, you can rent little flats in them. So that's what I did when I was working on the book is I, I took a flat there and stayed in a little flat. Oh, that's fabulous. Immerse myself in. So, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I try to get, um, I try to get inside the head of the people that I'm writing about. And then I try to, to um, always remember that they were people and that you, you know, you have a responsibility to, to put them on the page properly mm -hmm. and to not just yeah. make them do things or make them villains because it's convenient or to, um, or to even make them nice because it's convenient because not all the people were nice either. Right. Right? You know, so you've got to, you've got to do your diligence and, and try to try to really get as much information as you possibly can about somebody. If you're going to use a real person. And if you, for me, this is my, like, and again, everybody's different, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't hold everybody else to my standards. This is just me. Um, and, but for me, if I don't know enough about somebody to be able to use them for a certain role, then I will bring in a fictional person to play that part. Okay. Um, so that's, I'd like to actually explore that a little bit, um, talking about, about you as a writer personally. Mm. Um, this will be sort of two part, I guess. First of all, so have you always had an interest in historical, you know, has history always been a thing for you? Yep. Like, tell me, tell me a little bit yep. about background. Um, I, that comes from, um, I think, well, it's, I can blame my mother um, <laughs> and my dad, no, and my dad, but, uh, but mostly my mom. Um, my mom read us like Greek myths as bedtime stories and, and, but my, and my dad, my dad was, a, is, um, they're both still living touch wood. Um, my parents are amateur genealogists as ah, I. they passed okay. it down to me. So okay. I was born into this family of amateur genealogists. Got it. And um, we, you know, our, my family, my ancestors is a, is a, a very tangible thing for me. Like okay. it's not, it's not one of these things where you walk around going, oh, I'm descended from, so it's, it's more like, you know, yeah, this is my dad's family who were miners and weavers in the north of England. And, and you know, but that means that when I'm studying the, the Industrial Revolution, I can see them. There's these a are, connection These for you. are my family members who were moving with the mills and with the mines and mm -hmm. looking for work and being starved and being this. I've got, um, I have five ancestors on the Mayflower, you know, um, so you know, that's a whole thing mm -hmm. um, and a whole level of weirdness. 
uh, for a Canadian. Um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know, studying the American Revolution takes on a whole new, um, new level of stuff because I had members on both sides of that divide. That's how mm -hmm. part of us ended up in Canada. Um, my family actually owned a really nice chunk of land right across from, like right on Long Island, right across from Manhattan, almost where, um, you know, the, the airport is, where LaGuardia is, um, you know, and who would want to own that, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, but we lost it, you know, in the revolution. So it's, um, but history always had a face to me. Okay. It was, it wasn't just a, a dates and, and things that you memorized and things that you, you know, mm -hmm. you didn't pay attention to. It was always, I could put a family member on the ground when something was happening and it made it personal to me, it made it, and usually an ordinary person, usually not somebody that was like a, a you know, a high heat or right. you know, muckety muck. It was, it was always an ordinary folk person. Um, and those are the people I'm interested in. But how does this affect that person? How does that affect this family? How does the revolution affect this family who is divided by it, who are looking at each other across the table um, and trying to find a way around that? How does it affect the mother who is trying to keep her sons from, you know, killing each other when all she wants to do is sit down and have a meal with them? And how, do, you know, it, it's, it's, it was really interesting to sort of look at history through that perspective and it made me want to explore that in stories as well so on my mom's bookshelf um you know the rule was always if you can reach it you can read it and you know so I was taking down things like forever amber um which was you know the, the London plague um and you know I was reading historical novels when I was was quite young, but I was also reading Mary Stewart. I was also reading Daphne du Maurier. Um, read my way all through um, the. I I love um, all the Earl Stanley Gardner ones. I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. Massive. I I have what you can't see out of sight over that way. I've got like all Agatha Christie's nice. novels, every single one. When we flew on a plane. Um, as opposed to, I don't know how else you would fly. <laughs> Every, anytime we took a plane anywhere, um, at that time, the Toronto airport had like one little bookstore. And to keep us quiet, our parents would let us buy one book for the flight. And I would always buy, this was back in the seventies when they were reissuing all the Agatha Christie's in these matching covers. So I would always buy an Agatha Christie. And as a result, I've got like this whole set of Agatha nice. Christie ones. So that's part of my comfort reading too. Nice. Um, Cause she's really good at character. She's extremely good at character. A lot of people don't give her her due. Um, so I, you know, it's. Uh, it's almost like you had no choice but to yeah. be this author that you are. <laughs> I have a little bit of everything in the mix, but no. But his, <laughs> so history, yeah, history was always a getting, uh, yeah. I don't answer anything directly. I'm sorry. No, but, this you know, is, sure. that, but it's, see, it's, but this that's is, why everything goes in. History, the history, details, romance, everything, you know, the it, details just, are what everyone loves. So this, this is working. This is working. So, um, coming back to the vanished days, right? Yes. So we've got the dual timelines mm -hmm. and they're, and it's not past and present. It's both mm -hmm. past. So how did you decide to structure the book that way? That's, I think <laughs> a lot of people, you know, it feels like a natural thing to do present past and that's, there we go. So how did you, this is like a little bit off. So how did you come to that to be like, nope, too, too past to like tell us. I, tell us again, that. you're Just giving happened. me way too much credit for <laughs> like actually deciding to do anything. Um, <laughs> what happens is I get the first sentence of a book. Um, that's how I know I've got a book. I get like little bits and pieces of like, this might be happening. This might be something that, um, it started, I thought it was going to be, this is what I thought it was going to be. And it ended up not being anything like it. I thought I, again, like I come out of that whole, you know, 1970s era when they were, there were a lot of mini series, big giant, you know, doorstops of books that were things like the winds of war, right? The thorn were, birds. You know, <laughs> the, 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 like the winds of war was, was, um, you know, things that were happening in multiple fields of, of mm -hmm. action right you know where you'd have 
And when I learned about the Darien expedition, which was um, 1698 to, to 1700, roughly, and it was Scotland's attempt to, to build a colony in what is now Panama, um, roughly where the Panama Canal went through, a little bit south of there. Um, but it was a brilliant idea. And what they wanted to do was, was create a, a, a colony where they could bring the ships in on the Atlantic side of the, of the colony, unload the cargoes, carry them across that little isthmus and load them back on the ships on the Pacific side and send them off again. And by doing that, they would completely um, overtake the trade of everybody else that was having to go around the capes, right? So they'd undercut everybody. It was really, really smart. Um, but of course they got completely undercut themselves by the English king who was also Dutch, who was favoring both the English and the Dutch East India companies and had no intention of letting the Scots get ahead of either of those. So long story short, um, I found out about the Darien expedition. I found out that one of my favorite real life characters, Colonel Patrick Graham had a son who died uh, on the Darien expedition. I thought that this would be something that would maybe be the kernel of an interesting story to draw my characters in. Um, and this is playing around in my head. And as I'm gathering details by just reading stuff about the time period, um, I know that this is maybe going to tie in a little bit with the winter sea. Um, I get a first sentence. And not only is the, the first sentence is, I was a younger man when I first met her. So my first thought is crap. That's, that's a male first person voice, which I, I don't write male first person voices. And B, um, that's in the past. That's, you know, that's, that's my past person. Um, so that's a past person talking about the past and how do I deal with that? And that's not just a past person talking about the past, that's a past, person talking about the past talking about you know so it's kind of like my head was already hurting before I was like I don't I don't think I want to write this book I don't think I want to do it um but he was a very persistent voice and he and so I, I sat down and I wrote that I just let him go for the first page and once I had the first page down I thought okay I have to write this book because I really really love what he had to say and um when he when he got to the end of the first page and said, I've you know, no one but myself to blame. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm with you. I don't know where you're gonna take me. Off um, to the races. Off to the races, let's go. <laughs> um, I just had to trust him to, to take me and I had no idea where I was gonna end up. And um, it, was, it was a ride. And uh, you know, it was, it was very interesting trying to, <sighs> I try to scare myself a little with every book. Okay. I try to, I try to, this comes, this comes from Earl Stanley Gardner too. Um, uh, the, who wrote, um, completely blanking now. Um, somebody in the comments, Earl Stanley Gardner, Perry Mason. He's a mystery. He, Perry Mason. He was, he wrote, because I, I used to read all the Perry Mason books, but all the ones from the thirties where they were going in and having these amazing meals for like a buck 25. And, and he was, he would detail all their meals. Like, you know, they would go in and have these like, you know, roast beef dinners with this and that, and that for like a dollar 25. It's great. But the um, Perry Mason had in one of his writing advice things said that, you know, when something really scares you, don't stand on the bank and watch it, just wade in and tackle it. And I said, okay, all right. So this really, really terrifies me. Writing as a man, and writing dual time, but both in the past, never done it. Because the thing about writing dual time when you're doing a present day past mm -hmm. is that when you're in the present day, you can explain everything that's going on in the past to the reader in a voice that is familiar to them. You can have your museum curator or your historian or your people that know things in the present say, well, what was going on then was this and that and this. And what this means was this and that and this because you have the benefit of hindsight in the present day that the people in the past don't have. So you can frame everything and, and really lead your, your reader through everything quite easily. When you're in the past, everybody knows everything mm -hmm. that you know, is happening to them. They have no need to discuss it. 
they have absolutely no need to sit down. And, and it's easy to fall into that, as you know, Bob thing, which comes from the, as you know, Bob is a writer, a writer thing um, that it, we, <laughs> something you never want to do that comes from the old plays of the 1920s where the, the butler and the maid would come out before the main action of the play and they'd be, you know, dusting the, the furniture and, and be like, well, as you know, Alice, the, you know, the master is coming home tonight after, you know, being a, the young master is coming home tonight after being away for years. Well, as you know, Bob, you know, there was a terrible fight before he left. And it was about such and such. And they have absolutely no, no reason for talking to each other about this because they both know why young master so-and-so left, but they're telling the audience, right? So the, as you know, Bob, um, is something you never want to do. And yet, when you're when you have people in the past and they're saying, well, as you know, you know, good King Charles died last night. And said, of course I know, because he, you know, he just <laughs> why are we talking about this going down the street? We know he just died, you know, it's, it's it makes no sense. So when you're doing dual time past, it's tricky. And you have to rely on older characters telling younger characters things that happen. Uh or characters mm -hmm. that were in one part of the world telling characters who were in another part of the world mm -hmm. things that happened and you have it's it's really tricky to try to do it in a way that your readers aren't going to get lost in the story and in vanished days i had to throw a whole ton of really complicated history and religion at people and you know the only way i could think to do it was as a history lesson given by children to a child um, and pair it right down to its essence and mm -hmm. what would what would children care about so well and that's you know the interesting thing about that is you don't know who your readers are and you can't assume that they no. will know what you're talking no. about so there, you're never, there has to never be assume. yeah yeah never there's assume. there's probably a real fine balance between um, the exposition and over explaining then and I think you you definitely handle that of course quite well because it's you know it's your thing so it shows um so let's let's move into the trivia and so we're going to talk a little bit about Scotland here because you know as you've told us this is this is how your exposition happens and it's it's in um the Jacobite rebellion in Scotland so our friends at source books have put together some Scottish phrases for me, which I will now murder. Um, <laughs> I've never claimed <laughs> You'll be to be fine. To have a good one. So we're going to have the poll as our usual thing. We're going to have the poll pop up on the screens for everyone. And they've chosen some old Scottish sayings. So your task audience is to guess what these mean. Now, if you're on Facebook with us, go ahead and put um, we've got the questions coming into the comments and go ahead and answer them there and they'll they'll get you um, into that uh, prize pack possibility. So the first one we've got how your wish. Did I, is that even close? Did That's you? pretty close. <laughs> okay, good. That's pretty close. <laughs> so take a guess, take a guess as to what that means. If someone, uh, someone back, back then in Scotland would have said that to you. You're not even person. back then. It's like, not, do they say, is it's it Scott? Correct? So yeah. How'd you, right. you wish? All right. And then the second one, I'll pop that one up in just a second. And actually, while people are reading these and think about it, this is always where I like to ask our authors, tell us a little bit about what you're reading right now, because we all oh like to goodness. know, you know, what's what what do you what do you recommend? What are you reading? Oh, gosh. There's our second one up on the screen now. The ball is on the slates. Oh. <laughs> so what uh, what do you have to what do you have to recommend for us? Oh, my goodness. Well, you're going to do the, I'll, I don't want to interfere with this because you've got one more to go, right? Okay, well, we will okay. wait for that. You do one, one more and then I'll do, I'll, I'll try okay. to run fast. That sounds good. Do things for you. That sounds good. Because I want to leave time for people to ask questions. That la Yes, we've got some great questions. And I get, I get really well. chatty, so. No, no, it's quite all right. So we love to hear. And I know our, our third one is definitely, uh, a, it's, I'm going to laugh when I say it because it's. <laughs> it. <laughs> all right, it should be coming up here. There we go. Money and mickle max a muckle. <laughs> there you go. See? Five times fast, please. Right? Yeah, no. Just, just the once is enough, I think. 
So make your okay. guesses. And then while, Su while Susanna tells us uh, what her book recommendations are, then our source books friends will, will get the answers and we'll see if you got them right. So tell okay. us what you're So the book recs. Now I did send a list of these to Rebecca earlier. So you don't have to worry about writing them down because I know Rebecca has them and she will probably post them at some point. Get those in that chat um, for you. Okay. So every year at the holidays, starting in the beginning of December, my mother and I do a joint read um, of um, Rosamund Pilcher's Winter Solstice. It's Love our one, Pilcher, yes. It's our one book that um, that we do together. Nice. Um, it's just it's it's a lovely, 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 lovely holiday read. That's a good um, But I don't tend to read a lot of books that are very much like what I write okay. um, for a number of reasons but you know the I I, I tend to be I, I don't know if anybody can well my book is, this is all I read a lot of category romance this is my category romance shelf and other stuff um, but I also am very into um, like paranormal fantasy romantic mystery and adventure <laughs> just you know again cockapoo mixed with labradoodle stuff that uh, so one of my very very favorite authors is Mel Jean Brooke. Okay. Um, so Mel Jean uh, uh, gets me through. I, I, I read her books as a, a I, again and again, again and again as a, a sort of reward for getting to a certain point in my own writing. Um, if you haven't read Mel Jean Brooke, uh, steampunk books start with The Iron Duke. There's a whole world that she's written, uh, The Iron Seas, but start with The Iron Duke. And go on from there. Um, she also writes as Mila Vane. Um, and I'm partway through the first one of that. This is more high fantasy, uh, barbarian. It's called, called A Heart of Blood and Ashes. Um, and she's got like a series started with that. Um, but they are awesome. She creates worlds that have um, no edge. It's the best way I can describe it. Like there, well, that's when a, you're that's in the a nice phrase, I like when that. you're in the when you're in the world, um, you can't see beyond the horizon of the world, and you know that the world is a very large. It, it's it's just magical what she does. I really really love her writing. Um, I have forced more people than I know to read Bitten, and they always give me the same answer. They always say werewolves, and I always say trust me. Um, <laughs> Read Bitten by Kelly Armstrong, who's a fellow Canadian. Um, uh, I love the whole Women of the Other World series. It's an older series. She's moved more into mystery now too. She writes really good mystery, but they're like, this is mystery. This is mm -hmm. mystery. Uh, every single one of these has mystery in it, um, but uh, just a different kind of mystery. But my absolute favorite of this series is Dime Store Magic. Um, it's uh, a witch and a sorcerer and it's just they are my everything and every single time I interact with Kelly I'm on her butt to write more Lucas and Paige and she just I think she runs every time she sees me coming <laughs> you know it's just like um but these are really really awesome again if you're at all into paranormal stuff um and then anything anything absolutely anything by Nalini Singh uh, mm -hmm. good again there's always a mystery in and, and I think that's you know what I there's always a mystery but it's like it's the fantasy it's the paranormal it's the the romance and the mystery and everything all wound up together it's everything that I love um my current uh comfort read is a book by oh. a dear friend of mine called uh the nobodies by Liza Palmer mm -hmm. this is just a wonderful book um about uh uh a woman who's a little bit older than the other people she's working with at a company that's a little bit like BuzzFeed where Liza works and it's um it's just I I won't spoil it by saying too much about it but it's just for everybody that is not 20 anymore um it's just a great great book um and my son uh my elder son I've got two sons uh my older one is in his early 20s and he goes to university in Estonia um, and he bought me this for Christmas last year and I was deep in the writing of uh, The Vanished Days and I couldn't get into it last year. So I'm getting into it now. This is called An Unending Landscape. It's a little more on the literary side, a little more of a challenge. It is a story told 
three different ways. It's kind of it's kind of hard to describe, but it's like the same story told through three different ways within the same story like it's three different manuscripts so this, it's very it's very cool um so it's just but it's one that you may not be it's, it's an estonian writer it's in translation um and it's just if you want to introduce yourself to something new you might want to look it up an unending landscape by thomas um and then i like to read a lot of poetry so I am reading R.A.K. Mason's Collected Poems. He's a New Zealand author, uh, deceased. Um, this book has just been, uh, it's just a little book. It's just been republished by um, the University of uh, Victoria, I believe in New Zealand. Um, and uh, the uh, one of the poems in here called The Lesser Stars is, uh, gave me the title for the book that I'm working on now. It's oh, fun. Book gorgeous, gorgeous poem. Um, so that's the, um, the books that I have in, um, in um, print. And then this is the one I'm looking forward to reading most. I don't know if anybody's aware of this one. This is Must Love Books. This is by Shauna Robinson. This is coming out from Source Books in January, 2022. It's about Nora, who's a very overworked and underpaid and you know, somewhat disillusioned assistant, uh, editorial assistant at a, a publisher called Parsons Press, fictional publisher. Um, she starts moonlighting at a rival publishing house so that she can pay her rent. Um, except of course, everything gets like, you know, very complicated and very twisty, um, especially when she falls for um, Andrew, who's one of Parsons Press's best-selling authors that nobody, including Nora, can afford to let go. Uh -huh. um and shauna robinson is, is she's an introvert like me uh, she says so in her in her bio right up there and nice and, <laughs> and it's also her debut and i know firsthand that you know as a debut especially an introvert debut uh you don't really plug your own books and you don't really know how to plug your own books i'm gonna plug it for her because this is like just sounds like it's all in my cabinet and um so awesome. yeah january 2022 that's great. Well, thank you for sharing those books with us. Um, I know we are, I don't want to run out of time. So here are our um, trivia answers. So Hodgewished is be quiet, right? That's the correct mm -hmm. answer for that. Most people guess that. The second one, the balls on the slates is the actual answer is game over for that. So I like the snow on the roof though, because it's late, <laughs> roof. I would have guessed that. That totally would have been my guess. And then money a mickle makes a muckle. <laughs> Saving a small amount soon builds up to a large amount. I think people, you know, got the got the gist of it there. So great guesses, everyone. All right. So um, we have lots of questions, of course. Now the good news is because we chatted so long at the beginning. Many of the questions came through. You've actually already answered. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, wait! Oh, wait! Oh, wait!" So we've already we've we've covered a bunch of things already, which is good. A lot of people um, are very interested in your characters, of course, because right, they're the you know the, the big part of the book. So um, we have a quick question here from Carrie, or maybe it's Kari. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, she says, "I love how you've intertwined." so many characters and settings from your other books together. Do you intend that in the beginning of the story or does, does it just end up that way? And she mentions Bellwether, Mariana and the Winter Sea in Vanish. She loves that. So do these sort of just naturally flow to you? 90% of the time, it's just, they just ends up that way. The character okay. will just wander in. Um, in the Vanish days, there's a character uh, whose last name is Gilroy that I didn't even recognize where he came from until I got <laughs> sort of part way through the book. And I'm like, Gilroy, 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 Gilroy. Oh, <laughs> like, oh. oh. Um, it's my subconscious, obviously, at work, just throwing the character in there. And, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, I figure it out. Um, occasionally, I will sit down and think, you know, who do I have that could fill this role? Okay. Do I have one of these already? Do I have, I didn't at the beginning. Um, uh, I had a, a character um, once, uh, you know, who was a vicar that, that I needed a vicar for something. And, and he just turned up and did the thing and walked off. Um, and that made me think later, do I need someone who, um, you know, who can, can do this for me? If they, do I have to create a policeman or do I already have a policeman? Um, mm -hmm. That type of thing. 
Um, but 90% of the time, no, it's just the character will just turn up. And I always love it when they do, because it's like, they're just sort of hanging around going, oh, 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 I can do it. I can it's do my it. turn. It's my turn. Put me in, coach, I can do it, you know? And it's, it's, it's fun for me to see them as well. And a lot of the time, they're not the same age they were when I last saw them. So mm. it can be really interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, we have a question here from Donna. Uh, and she said, so she had read your note at the end of the book, and she would like to know if you could elaborate on how your dad helped you find Adam's voice. She's intrigued by that. Oh, book. because my, my, my daddy is, uh, you know, he would read Adam's sections for me to make sure that it sounded like a guy. And you can't, there, there is no universal male voice right mm -hmm. you can't when you're writing as a man you can't say okay this sounds like all oh, men it um, sounds manly it sounds manly you know <laughs> but but you you can pick um something that sounds convincing to like you know to a small group of like you know and i don't ever aim for just sort of like one guy one man um but you know, I've got my husband, I've got my dad, I've got, um, you know, my grandfather's people that I interact with really closely. And I can think, okay, well, this, this is sort of what they would be like. This is sort of, it does this sound convincing. And, and my husband, if I hand, hand him something and say, does this sound like something you would say, or does this, does this ring true? If you walk into a room, is that what you notice? He'd be like, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, but my father really took it very seriously. And, um, you know, so he was, he was very good at sort of giving me useful suggestions for, you know, I'm not sure I'd notice the curtains. I'm not sure I'd notice this. I think I would notice that more. And I would be, you know, it, he gave me a lot of very useful insights into, oh, really into, into finding what Adam would be, would be feeling and worrying about and thinking um, as he was going through his life. So it was, yeah. It was I cool. love it. That's very helpful. All right. So we have Carly who asks, uh, if there are times or places that you haven't yet written about, but you would like to in the future, I'm writing about one now. Um, Ooh, I give us the scoop. I, I'm the book if I'm writing can. now, the, less, <laughs> the Lesser Stars, um, uh, which will be coming out in probably 2024 because I'm super slow writing. I'm sorry. Um, is uh, it's dual time. Uh, seems to be my thing. That's triple time, actually. <laughs> And it's triple time okay. so it um is set in the past is 1613 so it's um the court of james the first and sixth okay. uh, just after just after queen elizabeth the first has died so it's the king that that took over right after that and i've never written about that time um but it's it's fascinating you're looking at sort of like shake early shakespearean like just that kind of time well sir walter raleigh shakespeare um you know, it's like you think Shakespeare in love kind of time. And it's I love reading about Queen Elizabeth's later years mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And I've never really set a book in that time period and I would love to explore it. So, yeah, a lot of like road trips on horseback is sort of my thing. So I'm enjoying it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have a question from Anastasia who I, I, this popped into my mind as soon as she said this, she, her question is, would you consider leading tours in Scotland of mm. the places you write about? And I immediately thought of like Rick Steves, like you could be the Canadian, or he maybe is Canadian, like the, the female no, Rick American. Steves. He's is he American? American? Well, actually, no, at the, um, in the Vanished Days, for anybody that's read the Vanished Days, um, the Grahams, now, the, um, I talk about the Black Pate, I talk about Colonel Graham, uh, the Black Pate was Colonel Graham's father, and they lived on Inchbrakey, which is the, the state that adjoined Abercarney. They are both now owned by the Murrays of Abercarney, Inchbrakey and Abercarney. But the Graham's descendants uh, are still Graham's. Mm -hmm. They now live in Devonshire. They okay. moved down to Devonshire in the um, late 1700s. Alex Graham, uh, who is a direct descendant of the Black Pate, He's a direct descendant of Maggie's father uh, in the book. Uh, the, the, I know, I go all over the place. Um, Alex Graham, who helps with my research as well, um, is a tour guide. Ah, he, he leads tours. Okay. This, this is where we're going with that. See, you didn't yes. know where we're going and now you know. Uh, <laughs> Alex Graham leads, um, leads tours. If you go on my Facebook page, I, I link to him all the time. And we have talked before about doing tours um, that Alex would lead 
into some of the sites of the novels. There you go. I would love to do that when, you know, when the world isn't trying to kill us quite so much. Yes, um, right. But when it would be it again. would be fun. It would be fun to let people see the the Inchbreak EU. Oh, absolutely. In the, in the company of um, a descendant of the Black Fate, I think that would be yeah. really super cool. And I, he's, I he's think such you've a got nice a, a built-in audience yeah. for that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I am sorry that we didn't get to every question, but like I said, a lot of people, we would, you had touched on things. We do have, um, I've got one last thing I wanted you to show off though. Uh, oh, during, okay. our, yep. during our practice session, I know everybody's been admiring Susanna's shelves back there and she has a doll oh, that, yeah. that we noticed that um, we wanted you to just, can yeah. you, can you bring her out briefly? I can, her say hello? I can actually. So if you've read, <laughs> if you've read The Vanished Days or if you haven't read The Vanished Days, there is a character in the Vanished Days called Maggie, little girl, and Captain Gordon, who some of you may know from the Winter Sea, gives Maggie a doll as a gift. And I didn't have a real doll that I was working from. I had I had done some research on the dolls of the period. I was sort of looking at the different dolls. And one of the things that I I gave myself after the book was published is I, I contacted a local doll maker up here who creates reproduction dolls and she carves them herself out of wood and she makes them exactly like they would have been made in the period in the late 1600s and I gave her the passages out of the book that refer to to Maggie's doll and she created the doll she carved the doll she hand dyed all the the um the Look fabric so this is Dolly my husband thinks I'm an idiot this is <laughs> this is Dolly she did it right down. If you've read the book, she even put in Dolly's little heart that Matthew made her out of wire. So that's Dolly. She's got a little braid. She's got it. the little blue cloak cape, that, yeah, that Barbara cloak. made her. She's got little legs that out of wood that bend. She's got little leather shoes that are sewn that on so that, so that when Maggie runs with her down the pier, they don't fall off. This is what she picked for her. Gotta keep your shoes on. She's got little petticoats. That are all, this is all hand stitched. This is all done by hand. But she's got the actual, the cloak comes off, but I'm not going to. But she's got the, the proper styling of the Look period. At that. So this is, this is what Dolly would have looked like if you're reading the book, you know. <laughs> and she usually stands on my, if you're seeing other things with me, she usually stands where Captain yes. America is standing right now. Happens Thank you so one much shelf for up. showing so. her to us. See, I think that that's a good that's a good place to stop. That I think is after we see Dolly. So. Thank you for sharing Dolly with us. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you. This was this was amazing to talk to. So thank you very much. For oh well, thank you everybody me. for coming. Thank you. It went so fast. And I know. <laughs> you know, if you have if you have other questions that I didn't get to, I'm really sorry I talked so long. Um, but you know, you can always find me over on my Facebook page or on Twitter. I'm on Twitter all the time. Feel free to you know just find me places and and ask me things and I'm always happy to answer things or you know or ask Margaret at, at source books and she'll pass things along to me. Um, you know, it's just me. I'm always happy to answer things for you. They are very good about that. Well, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I wanted to just mention really quick. So we've got our book bundle winners have just been posted in the chat. Um, Phyllis, Holly, and Kari. Carrie, sorry, um, go ahead and email Emily Ludoff at Sourcebooks. Her email is right there in the chat with your address so you can get your book bundle prize. And thank you to everybody who submitted a question. Um, thank you all for being with us here tonight. We always, you know, these chats are kind of the highlight of my month. I, I love getting to talk to such interesting authors about their books, about their process. And Susanna, it was absolutely delightful to chat with you. So thank you so much for joining us. Really, really well, thank appreciate you. Ditto. That. It's been a, it's been a treat. Thanks very awesome. much. Thank Everybody you. stay so, safe and have yes. a wonderful, wonderful holiday. Yes, yes. Everybody uh, take it easy out there. Um, make sure that you join us because we want to see you again next month for our next Mystery at the Library event. That one is actually going to be Wednesday, January 26th. I can't believe I just said next month and it's January is next, next month. Next year. It's yep. December today. Yep. Ah! So that's going to be on January 26th, which is my wedding anniversary. <gasps> So you all need to come and like bring a champagne flute or something along. Uh, so 
I thought you were going to say we all have to show up in like, like right? wedding dresses or something. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it a party. Yeah. We'll make okay. it a party. Uh, so that one is going to be, I'll be speaking to Joseph Knox, the author of the November 2021 Library Reads Pick Twisty Thriller True Crime Story. Mm -hmm. The registration for that has been entered into the chat, and I know you can find it all over the Sourcebook social media. So click on that and register for that. Thank you again for joining us. Stay safe, have a wonderful holiday season and happy reading everyone.